Hi everyone, I'm back again with Mentoring Sessions and today we will continue with the 7 series. So today we're going to be talking about 7 mistakes that single girls make, or 7 mistakes that single ladies make. I wanted to do this series because I actually think that um, there are some things that single girls are doing or single ladies are doing that um, is jeopardizing their chances of changing their lives or changing their status, okay? So if you want to get married, um, these are some of the things that I think you should um, pay close attention to so that it doesn't affect your future. <laughs> So the very first mistake is being desperate, okay? Um, and I got this from a message that I preached a while back, um, titled 10 Commandments of Dating. And that was the very first one on my list, which is thou shalt not be desperate. Um, I think one of the mistakes that single girls make is that desperation to be married causes them to do anything. Um, and the problem, let me tell you the problem. I'm going to tell you. The problem is that men can smell desperation a mile away. You don't know that, but men can smell desperation a mile away. Another problem with being desperate is the fact that when you make decisions when you are desperate, you make the worst decisions ever. I'll give you an example, and I'll give you an example from the Bible. Um, remember the story of Esau and Jacob? So Esau was entitled to the birthright as the first son. But he was hungry. <laughs> One day he came back from family, he was very hungry. And if you've ever been hungry, you know that kind of hunger that even human beings start to look edible to you. You know that kind of hunger? <laughs> no, maybe you don't know that kind of hunger, but there's that kind of hunger. <laughs> so he was really hungry, very hungry. And then his brother was making this hot porridge. Asaro, if you live in Nigeria, you know that one that is, 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 is orange, it's almost red, you know, the one they serve, they serve with fish, fried fish, exactly. So he came and his brother was making that kind of hot asaro, and he was really hungry. And he said, please give me porridge. And his brother said, I'll give you porridge on one condition. And he said, what, what? Ah, I'm hungry. And his brother said, if you will give me your bet right, I'll give you this porridge. And his answer was, what is bet right to me if I'm dead? Say, please give me porridge, Jerry, and keep bet, bet right. And his brother gave him that porridge. And that was how he lost his blessing. At the time when he wanted his blessing, his father said, I've given the blessing out, and I can't give it to you anymore. He lost his birthright. He lost the blessing. He lost his position as the first one because of hunger. He was desperate. And that's what desperation will do. It will make you choose people that you have no business being in a relationship with just because time is going just because you can't wait any longer, just because you are the only one that looks awkward among your friends. All of them are going out with guys, all of them are going out on a date, all of them are getting married, it's just you, you're tired of being a bridesmaid, so you are just getting desperate. And anybody, and that's when you start hearing things like, oh man, a man, is he not a man? Marry him. And you know in your heart that this man is nothing like what you want. But because you've gotten to a point where you're desperate, you just accept anything. Second reason why desperation is so bad is the fact that it makes you do stupid things. Stupid things. So I remember, I'll give you an example. Um, I remember when I was in, um, I was in my second year. Yeah, I believe I was my second year in university. Second or third? I can't remember. I think my second year in university. And there was this season, you know that exam period, eh? There's one season, almost exam, not just exam, almost exam, where like exam period time, when things have run out, you run out of provisions, you run out of food stuff, so everybody's hungry. You know, there, there's, a, there's always a season like that in school. And so all of us were hungry. I remember we were, <laughs> were lying down in our room, and all, me and my friends, and we were all lamenting about how hungry we were. And everybody was just going, hey, who get Gary, who get Gary? You know, everybody was just hungry, and nobody had food. And then while I was lying down there, I just remember that um, one of my friends was not feeling well, a guy. So I said, oh. So he's lying down here, hunger, won't keep person. Let me just go and see him and check up on him and see if he's fine. And use the opportunity to also visit one, one of our leaders in fellowship. So I got there and the guy was lying down. So I greeted him, it was my friend's brother. So I greeted him and I was like, oh, 
how are you feeling and everything. And then there was this hot bowl of rice, stew, and fried titles fish I will never forget. Hot, fresh, was beside him. And the guy said, have you eaten? I said, no, he said, eat now that he doesn't have appetite. And I said, ah, that's, this is why everybody's hungry, you're eating. So he now said, no, that he's not feeling well, that somebody brought it for him. So while I was sitting down there, and I was eating the food, one of, my, one of our other friends, another guy came in and said, uh, that me, I'm not ashamed, that I'm eating food that my mates brought. And I said, eh, hey, ah, please, who brought this food? And then he mentioned one of my roommate's name. Ah. I said, how is that even possible? I shall eat the food. I ate it very well, cleaned my mouth. I went to my room to go and just my friends. I said, hey, people won't believe the blessing of God I received. I even ate cake. They gave me dessert because there was cake there as well. So I go back to the room and I told them, I said, you won't believe what happened to me now. I ate rice, stew, and Titus fish with cake, dessert. I got dessert. So I said, ah, what happened? I said, ah, and that is one of our roommates so that she has food. Let's harass her when they come back. I said, it's not possible. She came back here and drank Gary now. So because of love, in quotes, she came to drink Gary. She cooked rice, stew, and this thing. Food that she could not give herself. She cooked it and went to give man. And this is what most girls do. Because you want to marry, you will go to his house early in the morning. You will go and sweep. You have his mother to wash clothes. The other day, was somebody was saying, should she give uh, her boyfriend's mother money monthly? <laughs> hey, God. Do you know the funny thing? That boy did not marry her. They are not married today. I kid you not. So she just suffered that so far for nothing. And God being God and the Holy Spirit, knowing that he will send a raven to feed me in the time of famine, told me, my daughter, stand up for me and visit your friend. That's how I was fed that day. God showed up for me. But this girl came back and was lamenting in the room and drinking Gary. Girls, stop lowering your standards. Stop doing the things that <laughs> you would not normally do just because you are desperate to be in a relationship. You know that the guy is not the kind of guy you like. But because you don't want to be the odd one out among your friends, you start doing silly things. You will go there. His friends will say, oh, you want to eat um, um, spaghetti bolognese? You go, you borrow money, you cook spaghetti bolognese. They'll be hailing you, our wife. This is normally what you will not do in your own life. You will not invest in your own life. But because you are desperate, you sleep with him, do anything he wants just to marry. And let me tell you, men are not externally motivated. Men are only internally motivated. Look, a woman is externally motivated. If you don't like a guy, if he takes you out, buys things for you, buys things for your friends that we vote, after a while, it's not looking so ugly anymore. Ah, he's such a nice guy. Friends, your friends will say, ah, he's very sweet. How can you not like him now for you? If it's me, I would have dated him. It's a lie. Because they want to be eating the shawarma, he'll be buying. He'll be telling you all these things. Because he has been nice to you, you start, you start seeing him in a different light. So women can be, their feelings can be altered. They can be motivated by the things that happen. He spends money on you. He spends time with you. He says nice things to you. But a man is not like that. If you bring sex, the man will sleep with you. If you bring money, he will help you spend it. But if he does not like you, he does not like you. You cannot do anything to change how a man feels about you. A man has to genuinely like you to actually be in a relationship with you. So don't be desperate. Men can smell it a mile away. They will just use you and move on. So if you're a single person, enjoy this season of being single. Have fun. Relax. Don't lower your standards just because you want to be in a relationship. Okay? So that's the first mistake most singles make. Being desperate. <laughs> the second mistake. Hmm. Having unrealistic lists. <laughs> The funny thing about this thing is that, you know, I've met a lot of women who are single today, and I ask them, ah, have you not met guys? They're like, ah, no, it's not what I want. Okay, so what do you want? Okay, he must be tall, six feet plus. He must be dark, ebony, you know, melanin popping. He must have pink lips, and that is ebony, and his eyes must be very white. Then he must have hooded eyes. When he does like this, you'll be seeing Michael Schofield. If you watch Prison Break, you know what I mean. Then he must be broad-chested and ripped. He must be athletic. He must be a prayer warrior. When he's praying like this, ah, the building will be shaking. And when he declares a thing, he must also be prophetic and a man that sees vision. He must know relationship like Pastor K. He must be a preacher. He must be a business tycoon. He must come from a well-to-do home. As you are saying it, your angel is ticking. Be writing, be, be adding to the list. It's taking time. 
There's no problem. God will give you what you want. It's just that it will take you time. It's okay. But sometimes, my question is, this list you are writing, are you the kind of person that the person on that list will also like? So you are writing long lists, demanding things that nobody, no human being, no human being can have all those qualities. One person. No, no. No. At least, even if I has all these things, you have a leg. What happened? It, only you. And God will not invest everything in only you. It's not, he, he's, he's a wise God and he's a good God. He will share it and it will reach all of us. So stop making unrealistic demands. Too many girls. You are setting your ways. This is how I want him to be. So okay, maybe he's even a prayer warrior. Maybe he's ripped. Maybe he's six feet. Maybe he's melanin popping. And then he's not so spiritual. Would you want that? Do you want that? Or maybe he has all these qualities you are looking for. And he's well to do and everything. But he's short. Can you manage that? Because the things that are, you must ask yourself what are the things, the deal breakers and the things that are essentials. If it's a non-essential, then maybe you should consider having that relationship. I'm not saying you should marry somebody you like. You know, I'm, I'm definitely not saying that. But I'm saying that you must look deeper at the more important qualities. Check on that list. Are there things that are really important for you? Sometimes, the things you are putting on your list are the things that are delaying you. They're not necessarily what you need. Let me give you an example of my own life. When I met my husband, I had this list. I had this crazy list before I got married. Me, I will tell you. You know, I will tell you people. Like, I love you, so I will tell you. So I had this crazy list before I got married. And they were not lists of what I wanted. They were lists of things I did not want. So number one on my list, I didn't want to marry an evil man. Maybe my reasons were stupid. It's your own opinion. It was what I didn't want. And I don't like what I eat. So if I don't want, I don't want. So I wrote, I said, I don't want an evil man because I don't like village. I'm a city girl. I'm sorry. I don't like village. And Igbo people, every December, they're in their village. Easter, they're in their village. I said, I can't deal. I cannot deal. So I told God, I said, I don't want an Igbo man. I don't want my an Igbo man. They also, I also felt they were very arrogant. So an Igbo man will take care of you because he wants to show you off. You know, I had some, like I said, they're not necessarily even true. But you know, it's what you see. That's your perspective. And if you stay in your own little world, you just be creating stupid ideas. Only you, if you're not talking to other people that are sensible, you just be confusing yourself by yourself. So I told myself, I said, me, I can't marry a woman, very arrogant people. They take care of their wives so they can boast. Is there really any problem with a man that takes care of his wife, even if it is to boast? But I had that notion. Second thing, I said, I didn't want to marry if a man that was fair in complexion. Say, me, I'm yellow like this. Now, marry my yellow. Now I'm going to give it to Albino. I know, I know it's not possible, but you know, I just had those crazy things. So I don't want to marry a man that is fair. What's that? Me, I would not be buying cream. It would be buying cream. I beg. I want a man that will just have his butt and move. You know, I had all those kind of stupid, <laughs> stupid things. Um, the third thing, I didn't want a man that was hairy. I'm very hairy. So I was just saying, God, let's not go and have gorilla. Or oh, our children will not be there, <laughs> convert from head to two. Um, I also didn't want to marry a pastor. So I said, God, I will never marry. I don't want a pastor. First of all, I'm not a pastor's wife. No pastor's wife, they are gentle. They won't be talking to you the way I'm talking to you like this. They're very gentle. They'll be telling you, bless you. Even if you're annoying them, they'll turn the other cheek. Me, I will shout to. You cannot annoy me and go scot free. I will not see something and close my mouth, you know? And so I had all those, this is not how a pastor's wife should be. A pastor's wife should be very quiet, very chill. She will be saying, bless you. She will sit down in front in church, wear big hats. And I mean, I can't sit down. If something's not working, I will stand up and go and walk it, you know? So I just had all those things in my head, like, I can't do this. So even when I was in school, a lot of guys that were very busy in ministry at the time, involved in fellowship in school and all that, they would propose me. Can't even talk to me. I know what I want and I know where I'm going. I don't want pastor. Lo and behold, everything on this list, eh? everything I just said to you, is what my husband is. My husband is a pastor. He's an evil man. He's very hairy. Uh, what was the last thing I said? I can't remember. Every single thing I did not want, God put everything I needed and rolled it all together and put it in that man. And today, I am so grateful to God that I didn't stick to that my stupid list. So what I'm asking you today is your list stupid. Is it unrealistic? Look at it and judge for yourself that all these things, can it be in one human being? Meanwhile, there's one great guy that has been hanging around you, bring out your list. Mm -mm, he's not, no, I can't do this myself. No, he's not six feet, ooh, he's 5'11". No, 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 six feet one. No, I can't do 5'11". You can't do 5'11". <laughs> May you not end up with 4'3". Mm. If you can't do 5'11", <laughs> ask yourself, Sincerely, what are the things that are important? Is he kind? Does he love the Lord? Is he generous? Is he a man that listens to me? Is he a man that cares about me? These are all the things I asked myself. Most was crazy about me. He would listen to me. He wanted my dreams to come to pass. He wanted me to be happy. He would ask my opinion. Those were the things that were important to me. I didn't even know. 
I was there talking about, I don't want pastor. I don't want pastor. I don't want pastor. Imagine if I kept saying that, I would still be single today. Because it seemed like only pastors were proposing to me. <laughs> so that's the second mistake, having unrealistic lists. The third one, hmm. seeing men as trees. I'm going to explain that, but that I, couldn't, I couldn't come up with a, a, a title <laughs> that could really explain what I was trying to say, so I had to use this. And I'll, I'll tell you where I got it. I got it from the story of where Jesus healed the blind man. There was a blind man who was asking for Jesus to heal him, and then Jesus took uh, mud from the ground and spat into it and mixed it and rubbed it on the guy's eyes and told him to go and wash. And the guy washed his eyes, and Jesus said, what do you see? And the man said, I see men as trees. And then Jesus re put his hands on his eyes again and prayed for him again and he was healed. And then he began to see men as men. Listen, that scripture always, for me, it always speaks of not seeing things for what they are. He said he was seeing men but as trees. So they were men but he wasn't really seeing them the way he should see them. And that sometimes is the mistake that single girls make. So you see someone and you have commonized him. He's just a guy. So you don't really see him as husband material, if there's such a thing. But you are seeing him as just a guy. Or the worst one, he's my friend. So I see a lot of girls and I say, ah, this guy is hanging around you. How far now? You know, I say, Pastor him, no, this one. Ah, he's just my friend. And my question is, is he your enemy you will marry before? It's not your friend you will marry. Once, because a guy is your friend or you friend zoned him, you will never see him as, as potential husband material. And it is one of the prayers you need to pray for yourself, that God will open your eyes to begin to see men as men and not as trees. Because too many women have friends zoned good men. So you're expecting the guy to be someone you've never met before, one spectacular guy that's coming from somewhere. He may just be your friend. My husband and I were friends. I didn't see him as a potential. In fact, Apart from all the other things that I said I didn't like about him, by the time we started getting close and I started saying, oh, this guy is like, it's not such a bad guy. But I had friends owned him. I tried to. Let me not say I friends owned him. I tried friends owned him. The guy was not agreeing. So he would send me a message. I would say, oh, thanks for checking up on your baby sister. Oh, Mo, who is your baby sister? He would just ignore that part of the message <laughs> and just continue to talk to me as if, ah, nobody's playing with you. Why are you, you are trying to friends zone me? Me, I'm smarter than that. And so after a while, I started seeing a possibility. Even though we had such a friendship that, I was, I was literally going to friend zone him because I kept thinking of him as tree and not as a man. So my husband and I were such good friends that I would do something and he, he would push my head. You know how you push your younger sister's head and say, see this one? That's how we were so playful, we're so, such good friends. So I didn't see it. So when I even started sensing that, well, this may be what God is saying. And then I got a word from God that this is the guy, you know. I struggled with it a bit though. I was like, this one, ah, this one, no. Because, you know, see, finish can enter when somebody is your friend. And like this one, it's not romantic. He doesn't even try. You just say, one day we went out. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, ah, you, you can't even open the door for somebody. He said, you aren't paying you. I mean, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? That's how much of a regular guy he was to me. Like, if somebody wants to marry you or somebody's toasting you, you tell him that, oh, you know, but if we even say it, we open doors for you, all those kind of things that are romantic, pull out chair. I was going to say, you are not paying you. Or we'll go somewhere. I remember, <laughs> I remember we went somewhere and we bought food and they forgot to put two spoons. And he said, eh, hey, it's not going to do gentleman here. That's what was we share that spoon. And we will count it. I will take one spoon. He will take one spoon. <laughs> I said, do you understand? So I could have just said, this one is not marriage material because it's not acting like, oh, I'm the man, I'm the head, I'm the... You will just miss a great guy because you are not seeing him for what he really is. So that's the third mistake. Seeing men as trees and not as men. Not seeing them for the potential that they have to be the amazing husband that they can be because he's just one of the guys, your friend, this one, this one. I'm going to say, are you really looking at me? Say this one. Me, this one. Ah, I beg, I beg, I beg. I can't marry this guy. <laughs> but he may just be the exact person that you need. Okay? So number four. Mm, number four, this one. Hmm. Premarital sex. Mistakes single girls make. You are sleeping with the guy now and you think he's going to marry you. Let me tell you the truth. I've, I heard, uh, I think it was, I can't remember now, but a while back, I was, still, I was still single. I was still very young, in fact, when I heard that saying, that why buy the cow when the milk is free? And that was, so two guys, two guys were talking 
and then someone was asking, I read it somewhere, two guys were talking, and then someone was asking about the guy and the girl that he was with. He had been with the girl for years. And so his friend was asking him, that, ah, you've been with this girl for years, so when are you going to make an honest woman of her? And when are you going to marry her? And the guy said, why buy the car when the milk is free? In other words, he was getting everything he already would need in marriage anyway. He was sleeping with her, she was cooking for him, she was coming over for the weekends to, to clean and to do everything. So what's, what's, what exactly is the reason why he should marry you? So you're having sex now. You're, you're, you're increasing your appetite for sexual, sexual intimacies that you may not even need. You're sleeping around. This one doesn't marry you. Sleep with another one. This one doesn't marry you. Sleep with another one. You're messing up your life. Not to mention the amount of diseases that you can possibly pick up. Or the fact that those diseases can lead to infertility. So when you do marry, then we can now, we will now come and start praying in Hannah's heart. <laughs> Premarital sex is wrong. Let me tell you, the Bible says that premarital sex is wrong. Premarital sex is wrong. I know it's not, it's not a cool thing to say these days. Because I mean, how will you marry somebody that you have not tested? How will you marry somebody that you've not tried out? How will you know if you're sexually compatible? Listen, God's plan was that two people would marry and then they would spend the rest of their lives figuring out themselves sexually, enjoying themselves sexually. Not to finish the honey before you get to the honeymoon. So a lot of times when people now get married, they're tired. So you have finished the race, but when we now blow whistle and your mask sets go, you can't go anymore because there's nothing left. All your energy has been used. Listen, this sex that you are, you are rushing to do, in marriage is work. So in marriage, there will be beautiful sex and beautiful sex. Beautiful sex is both of you are in the mood, you're tearing your clothes, you're everywhere, you're jumping everywhere, you're falling everywhere. Nobody's scatter, nobody breaks plates, sure, but let me just help you because you have been watching a romantic movie. It's not true. We don't break plates because number one, if you break it, we we'll clean it. Number two, we replace it. We don't do all those things. So you do all those things. That's, rom that's beautiful sex. Dutiful sex is you are not in the mood, but your husband is in the mood. What's the alternative? Should you go outside? You adjust yourself and be pretend like it is beautiful sex. And if you do it well enough, it will turn to beautiful sex. So premarital sex is a no-no. Absolute no. It is wrong even if you are in love. Premarital sex is wrong even if you are in love. Premarital sex is wrong even if you use a condom. Oh, I'm going to tell you a sad story. Let me tell you the sad story of this, this, this girl, this my amazing daughter that used to be in church before she got married. Her first time, she was in her final year, no, third year in school. So her friends are started making fun of her that you are still a virgin. You're not even ashamed of yourself. Can I say a virgin? No, things like that. And you know these days, people that are doing the wrong thing are so bold. They almost intimidate those of you that are doing the right thing. Listen, there are still a lot of people who are sexually pure. As my husband would say, you are the only one remaining. There are still so many people that are getting married as virgins, male and female. So I'm saying this to you. I'm also going to go, go after the men because it takes two, male and female. We're wedding in, in fact, I think the ratio that we have wedded is more. The, we wedded more virgins than more non-virgins, two of them. And you ask, how do I know? Because I know you people. I know you ask questions. You say, how do I know? How do you know? Maybe they are pretending for you. Because even after the wedding, we now have to come and now start teaching them what to do, where to put what, and what to touch what. So I'm telling you, you are the only one left. Satan is still deceiving you. Come out. Come out from there and stop it. So this girl, her friends were making fun of her. In her third year, true life story, I know this girl. Not that they gisted me or somebody gisted me. Like my daughter, daughter, I can't call her name. Third year in school, her friends were making fun of her that you, you have not had sex. So Valentine's Day, and I said, okay. Her boyfriend had been stopping her anyway, and she had telling him, no, 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 no. So she said she was going to do it with him on Valentine's Day. So they used the condom. A few months down the line, she, f she was ill. So she thought she had malaria, so she went to the hospital and they did a full test for her. She found that she was HIV positive. She went to the guy and told the guy, the guy said, oh, he was HIV positive, but he used a condom. So he assumed nothing would happen. So apparently, who knew? Maybe the condom had a hole. Could be a tiny hole. You know, some things, anything can happen. Or maybe the condom tore. Anything can happen. Maybe in the heat of fashion. Condom, anything could have happened. That's the honest truth. Till today, I'm telling you, that guy is HIV positive. Till today. She had to be taking drugs. She had to also marry somebody who was HIV positive as well. It was a, a whole different, I mean, it was drama. Every time I see her, I'm like, this girl, could, her life could have turned out differently. She now, her choices were limited because all the people that they even liked her, when they hear she's HIV positive, they will go their way because they cannot come and shout. So she, her choices of who to marry were now limited. So anything happens, all those who are using a condom, using a condom does not negate the fact that it is sin. 
Anything that displeases God is sin. So premarital sex is one huge mistake. You think you can change a man's mind because you're sleeping with him. Do you know how many other girls are sleeping with him? You have no idea. It's a mad world out there. So if you can preserve yourself, please preserve yourself. Do not use it as a trade. You don't trade sex for marriage. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The next mistake is fighting everybody when you now finally find somebody you want to marry. And this one is so common. And as a pastor, I see this all the time. So I'll have somebody who's close to me, my daughter, everything, and we've been believing God for us to get married, finally finds a guy, and they will say, okay, do counseling, you know. Let's find out how the guy is. All of a sudden, I'm the enemy. And that's a huge mistake. You know why? Because you are in love. I'm not. So it's always important that you have someone who is not as in love with the guy as you are, so they can see for you. They can ask honest, simple questions. The guy is treating you bad. Even the funny things, you are in love, anything is good, though. The guy slaps you. He didn't really slap me. His affection is tap. He just wanted to feel my cheek. You just be, say, only you be saying rubbish to yourself. Be convincing yourself of nonsense. He's sleeping with girls. You say, no, he's just practicing, so he will know how sex will be. You just be telling yourself stupid things. He doesn't ever bring money. You say, oh, no, it's not that he's stingy. It's just that he always forgets his wallet when we go out. It's these things I'm saying to you. It's only when you're in love it makes sense. The rest of us, it does not make sense. How does somebody forget their wallet every single time they're going out with you? How? How does the fact that, oh, he, does, he knows I don't want to have sex with him, so he's sleeping with other people. How does that even make sense? I've had too many girls send me that kind of message. And my boyfriend, he's not sleeping with me, though, but he's sleeping with other girls because I've told him we'll wait until marriage. Are you, are you, are you, are you, how? How are you, are you thinking? How? How does that even make sense to you? And how does it make sense to you that when you now get married, that he will stop? Then when he now starts cheating on you in marriage, you're now angry. You can't be angry. You trained him. So I always tell people, don't complain about what you accept, what you allow, or what you even start. You trained him that way. So you are fighting with everyone that is a voice of reason in your life. Your parents tell you something. They don't understand. They are just trying to be difficult. They don't want you to marry. How can all of us that have been praying for you to marry since all of a sudden don't want you to marry when you now meet the guy? The prayer we've been praying, God has answered it, and we are now trying not to. Stop fighting the people who are really just looking out for you. So it's a lot of single girls do this. Once they meet the guy, he becomes the ultimate voice in their lives. You don't throw your family away just because you are getting married. You will need your family. If anything happens, God forbid, who will you run to? Don't marry a man that isolates you. So you're in a relationship with a guy who's isolating you. Every other person, everything you tell him, you say, they don't care about us, baby. They don't care about us. Don't tell them, well, it's just between me and you. It's just me and your girl married, baby. Other things lie, lie. Let him come and tell us that thing. So if you're in a relationship, once you get into a relationship, I always advise people that ladies are close to me, let him talk, let him meet your pastor. Let him talk to you. And you know the funny thing is that there are some guys, I, I don't want to go into too many stories. I don't want to go into too many stories. But I, I bec because I've been pastoring for a while now, I've encountered too many things. So you see one guy is dating three girls in three different services in the same church. So he has service, first service girlfriend, second service girlfriend, third service girlfriend. And the three girls don't know because he has told them don't tell anybody. Don't let any man keep you secret. No, relationship is not, marriage is not a secret thing. We will all come out and they will say, guy, we are gathered together to join this, this, this and this person in the presence of these many witnesses. That's how they marry, in front of many witnesses. So relationship should also be in front of many witnesses. They won't hide you. They say, oh, no, baby, I like to keep my things private, so I don't like to put you on social media. I'm a social media person. No, a social media person, but you wear a T-shirt, you put it on social media. You will buy a car, you put it on social media. He has dog, you put it on social media. He has face cap, you put it on social media. It's you that is the most important thing in his life that he cannot put on social media. Oh, no, I'm not a social media person. All of a sudden, you need to ask yourself questions. You need to talk to people who are seen clearly. Don't fight every important person in your life just because you have met the one. Because he's the one does not now neg negate the rest of us. I was going to say praise God right there because that's a good place to praise God. <laughs> okay, so number five, don't fight everyone and please get counsel. So important, please get counsel. Don't make the mistake of not getting counsel. People, your counselors will ask you honest questions. They will bring out things. They will bring out patterns. Is he hot-tempered? You know, I hear a lot of people say, no, he's not really hot-tempered. It's not really, he doesn't beat me. It's just that he lost his temper. And my question is, if he loses his temper, must he find it on you? 
Must it be you he beats to find it? Or say, no, he doesn't really hit me. Every time he's angry, he hits the wall. One day there will be no wall and you are the only one standing there. What then happens? So let people ask you questions. Be open. Don't go to counseling and lie. Because a lot of, a lot of, oh, a lot of ladies do that. So you, just, you don't want to say anything so that they don't know, so that you will marry, you just marry, you just want to marry. That's also being desperate. Okay? Next point. Lack of preparation. Oh, this one is so important and it's a huge mistake. So you are preparing, first of all, most times you are preparing for the wedding, not the marriage. And the wedding, <laughs> the wedding is just a few hours. The marriage is for life. So you can't prepare for weddings. You're buying your dress from, I mean, God knows where. You're buying your dress, your ring, your shoes, you've planned your makeup artist, your hair, the caterer, decoration, cake, everything must be best, best, best. But you have not invested in learning anything about marriage. You don't know what is expected in marriage. You don't know the things that will shock you. You don't even know, you have no clue what you are getting into. And like I always say, I grew up with a lot of proverbs. I grew up around my grandmom and my mom a lot. So I grew up with a lot of proverbs. And my mom would always say, you don't know the journey you are going and you didn't carry water. That's exactly how I feel. You don't know what marriage is. You're not prepared. You don't carry water for the journey ahead of you. Marriage is not just, oh, we love each other. We love each other, but there will be challenges. Every marriage gets to have a test. Every marriage has a test. If it's not financial, it's not children, it's behavior. It may be something your husband does that annoys you. Are you prepared for that? Have you asked yourself how you would deal with that? Do you know what is expected of you as a wife? Do you know your roles? Do you know the needs of your... There are so many, so many things. Do you know how to settle conflicts? I always tell people, my husband and I have never quarreled. In the last 15 years, we will never... People have lived with us constantly. We've never raised our... Not that we don't have misunderstandings, but we know how to settle it. We have an agreement in our family that two people cannot be mad at the same time. If you see that I'm getting mad, walk away. If you, I see you are getting mad, I walk away. I will just tell you sorry. I mean, I've learned sorry is not apology for doing wrong. Sorry is for peace. So whether I'm right or wrong, I tell my husband sorry. I say sorry, don't be angry. You say no, I say sorry now. Nah. Uh -uh. Sorry. If we are not an idol, we will not worship you, but sorry. <laughs> you know, I will hug and we will laugh. I will think only me will be okay. I will move on. It doesn't make a fool out of me. It just means that I'm preserving my own. Oh, these are things you will learn in counseling. You will learn you can never raise your voice at your husband. Your husband will, will learn things. He will learn how to treat you. You will learn the things you need, the security, the peace of mind. You will learn, see, the things you can't even say, your counselor will say on your behalf. But you, are, you don't want to learn. You don't want to ask questions. You don't want to read books. Read books on marriage. Attend seminars. Listen, buy messages. We have, uh, I can't even count the number of messages we have. Go to our website, ldmwithpk.org. There's, there's literally no, no topic long distance, infidelity, um, anything you're looking for. There's a message or a book that covers it. So go after knowledge. Prepare yourself. I talked about unrealistic lists before. Every, every girl wants a man that is this, this is spiritual. He can do this. He can provide. He can do What about you? Are you the kind of person he wants to marry? Are you preparing yourself for what you have written down on that list? Because everyone needs a list. I agree. I'm just saying don't have only unrealistic lists. Have a list of what you want. You want a man that is kind. Are you kind? Once a man that is generous, are you generous? God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that will really reap. If you sow rubbish, you will reap rubbish. Don't, don't, God is not going to carry one of his precious sons and waste it on you if you're not ready. No. You attract who you are. It's your kind that you produce after. So you attract who you are. So are you prepared for the kind of man that you are believing for? The kind of man that you want to spend the rest of your life? I want him to be generous. You, Akagom. You can't sow. You can't give anybody. Even your mother in the village, you can't send money to her. And you want a man that is generous. You think you can survive with a man that is generous? He will send, to, he will send money to everybody. You will be dying because you can't even release more. It's our money. I'm giving our money out. But that's what you prayed for. Are you prepared for it? So a lot of women make the mistake of preparing for wedding but not preparing for marriage. You're writing lists, but you're not preparing for the man on that list. Okay? So that's the next one. Finally. I can't believe I'm done. Finally. Wasting time huge mistake so many girls make the mistake of wasting time listen as a woman eh, you don't have time let me say that again as a woman you don't have time you don't have all the time in the world as a woman your your biological clock is ticking your emotional clock is ticking your financial clock is ticking your I mean, as a woman, you don't have all the time in the world. And the mistake is that you waste time like you do. So you are, you are posing. You are over, overly selective. I'm not saying you should pick the best. Oh, by all means, please. I'm such a, a sickler for the fact that you have choice. 
Don't just pick anybody. You are the prize. You are the one that is deserving of him. You are the one that is worthy. You are the one a man should chase. Because when you know what you carry, you are the one that carries virtue. The Bible says the virtuous woman is a crown unto us. When he chases you and he meets you, you put a crown on his head, he becomes a king. So you are worthy. You are worth it. Says he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor. So you are the favor pipe. Once you enter his life, favor, things start to change. So don't be desperate. Don't think, yeah, I want a man. No, I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm saying at all. But don't be unrealistic and don't waste time. You don't have time. So you say, oh, me, I'm, th I'm 30. I, I, I mean, there's no hurry. There's hurry. There's hurry. I got married. <laughs> Listen, you, and the thing is about marriage, about life. I can't even say married. Life. You don't really know what is in store for you in life. So I got married at 25. Yeah, I was 25. I turned 26 the month I got married, but I was 25 when I got married. I had my, I had my first, I had my first child um, at 34. Yes, I had my first child at 34. I got pregnant um, at about that late 30, like late 33, about that, that time or early 35, I can't remember. But I had my, so you can imagine, the time that I was wasting. So imagine, let me just imagine, let me calculate it with you. Imagine I got married out. I have time, I have time, I have time. So I say, I don't have time, there's no hurry. There's no hurry, I have time. Then I now get married at 36 because I have time. And then Satan with his wife and Abra's another eight years. So join that. So imagine when I would have had my first child. You would not be, so we're going for PT, PTA. Small, small girls are going to you, your grandmother. So they will tell your child, oh, is that your grandma? You say, no, that's my mommy. See, we don't even have energy to run around with the child. The child wants to run and jump. You, you will not be using walking work, stick. You are posing. You don't know what's ahead. Do you know whether you're going to struggle with fertility? I know friend, my friends of mine have been, have been waiting for 15 years. 15. So imagine they got married at 35. They are at 50 now. There's still no child. And you know as you're getting older, the chances are dropping. And I'm not threatening you. I'm just saying stop wasting time. We also have the habit of sp staying with time wasters. I've, I've always said it. They are what, what I call human delay. You know those guys, eh? That they are in your life. They are dating you. They are dating you. Not, you know, no prospect of marriage. They are just dating you. First year. Second year. She's my girlfriend. Third year. You know, it's special to me. Fourth year. You know, sweetheart. I can't live without you. Fifth year. You're my darling. Seven. Ah, then first start calling you wifey. Wifey. Our wifey. Eight. The year eight. Nine. Ten. The tenth year. You see where Jenny in his bag. And it's not your name that is on the card. <laughs> There are people like that. They will date the life out of you, literally. You won't have, they will not be taking your years. They will be dating you, dating you, dating you. They are not moving forward. As they will say in, uh, in worry, you know fail, you know pass, you know come up for class. So he's there. He's not making progress. He's not really moving backwards, but he's not making progress. He's just there. You know fail, you know pass, you know come up for class. He's blocking your path. And then the problem is that he's there, but he's not really doing anything. He's not making progress to marry you. So every other person that would have liked to marry you, they'll say, oh, no, she's in a relationship. The first guy has come. He has gone to marry somebody else. He has two children. The second one comes. Say, oh, this girl, no, she's in a relationship. And it's a serious relationship. She has been with him for three years. Another one will come again. That's why that guy will be there wasting your time. Wasting your time. And women will be there investing in that one. Say, no, he lo I love him. Love. I agree that you love him. My question is, does he love you? A man will waste your time for 10 years. Does he love you? And women will be okay with that. Time wasters. Marry men that are not available for marriage. Second one, you are, marrying, you are dating married men. Man that will never leave his wife for you. You are just a thing, a toy to be played with. The man is invested in his family. He's flying his wife all around the world, taking care of her, opening business, giving his small money. Is that uh, 500K, 700K that is deceiving you, that uh, is using to trade away your destiny? Then when it's time to not get married, you can't be satisfied because you marry your mates. And that one cannot afford to give you anything. So he's giving you 100K and he's shouting on you, I'm the man of this house. You can't take it because you have trained yourself. You have wasted, you've wasted as if you won't get married because you waste your time. You will drag out 10 years. And you see the thing about the spirit, the spirit realm is that spirits understand that things, you know, it's not just what we see. So you're sleeping with a married man, you're having sex. As far as you're having sex, in the spirit realm, it almost seems like you're married. So you become unavailable. You have airs of being unavailable. So nobody, single men will not see you. There will just, just be something unavailable about you. You are in a relationship with somebody that can marry you. The people that can marry you see you are unavailable. It will just be there. It's an aura. It's an aura that's about you. And you are dating a married man. And his wife 
if God catch you, you go and date a man that his wife is a prayer woman. She will not be sending silent curses in your direction, deep curses. And the Bible says, cause, curseless cannot come. But the curse that has cause will come, it will stand, it will germinate, it will reproduce. So you'll be having generational, people say generational curses. It is one thing that you have done, that the woman has spread into your generation. That you too, your daughter will never leave your family. That's if you give birth. Because that one is another curse again. I don't want to read all those scriptures. That one is another curse in the Bible. You sleep with a married man. The curse is that the five broad will start to grow in your womb. As in people don't know this, people don't read the Bible now. Five broad will be there, then he says you will be childless. I, I don't want to read it for you. But I'm advising you now. Stop dating unavailable men. Stop wasting your time. Stop being side chick. You were not created to be side chick. You were created to be main wife. Be the wife of one man and be happy. You want to destroy somebody else's home and get married. It doesn't work that way. A married man means he has a wife. You are causing her pain by sleeping with her husband. And you think that you, now you want to destroy somebody's home. And you are destroying something and praying for it. You are destroying marriage. And you think, God, I want to marry. How oh, now? I, sometimes I wonder if people think that this God is Babalao. He's a God, though. God that sees everything. And he's a just God. Except he's not my Jesus. So if you are serving another God, if it's table you are serving, table can answer you. But my Jesus. It's just now. It's just. You can't destroy someone's home and be praying for marriage. It doesn't work that way. So that's another thing single ladies may do. You waste your time. Waste your time with un unavailable men, married men, men, and, and then waste your time by being overly choosy. Then when time has gone, you now become desperate. So, I hope we're still friends. <laughs> because it's from a place of love. Even though I say these things to you, it is from a place of love. And I want you to sit up, look into your life and say, what am I doing wrong? I want you to be happy. I want you to be happily married. I want you to be married to the man of your dreams. Okay, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. I'm done.